Good evening. Is this, uh, can you hear me back there? It's always a stupid question because if you can't hear me, you're not going to raise your hand. But, uh, but uh, I got the result I wanted. So here we go. My name is Mike Cattle, and I am the uh, interim director of the Knowlton School of Architecture. And it's my pleasure to introduce this autumn's Baumer Lecture Series, which is entitled Precision. <clears throat> As the design disciplines have emerged out of the polemical debates of the 90s, and the infrastructural proposals of the past decade, a group of practitioners has emerged that is both culturally informed and technically adept. Whether we analyze the green techniques of Kieran Timberlake, the exquisite tectonics of Smith, Miller, and Hawkinson, the vernacular rephrasings of Fresneau and Hartman, the land use interpretations of Matthew Coolidge, the performative sites of Michael Blear, <clears throat> or the multifaceted cultural practices of Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro, each is a practice that is both conceptually consistent and rigorously executed. They are practices of precision. The work of our first lecturer, Craig Scott, is another case in point. <clears throat> Following the generation of architects such as Greg Lynn and Bernard Cash, whose early work explored the formal and theoretical implications of new technologies, Craig Scott and his partner, Lisa Iwamoto, are invested in the built artifacts of digital production and its perceptual and experiential qualities. While their work is rarely explicit in its ideology as that of <laughs> its predecessors, its liberating desires are implicit in its unorthodox use of materials and site reciprocities. The interest in perception and experience might suggest previous phenomenological strategies, strategies that often reinforce conservative modes of perception. Yet Scott and Iwamoto's work generates new perceptions, new moods, new ways of negotiating the world. They are prolific and gaining in stature. The 22 design awards, 35 exhibitions, and over 100 sightings in periodicals and books. So please join me in welcoming Craig Scott. Hello. Wow. That's, uh, <laughs> I have two mics on here. so. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Michael, and it's great to be here. Last time I was in Columbus, your building wasn't here, um, and uh, it's really a great space to teach and learn about architecture, I think, from my one day here. I, I couldn't stop wandering around and discovering all the amazing spaces, and I was telling um, some of your professors that I in fact, teaching an advanced studio this semester on a new um, school for where I teach in San Francisco, CCA. So, and this was one of the precedents I gave the students for analysis. So I can go back and report in person you know, how great it is as a space. Um, I'm going to talk about our work. Um, this is a bunch of it over a number of years, but the main focus tonight will be um, more the more recent work uh, of, say, the past five years or so, and even more focused on um, the more recent work of that. But the organization of it um, basically follows a kind of set of three groupings, of which, which are the three avenues that our practice continues to to um, investigate uh, installations and building scale projects and uh, speculative work, um, which uh, at times has been about uh, looking into the future. Um, and so of those, uh, 
there's a kind of rough organization in terms of scale to the, to the work that I'll show tonight. And to begin, just to say a few words about some of the things we um, think about, um, it's both in the world of um, the, the natural world around us, things we um, think about, look at, and analyze, and uh, the disciplines of art practice and the discipline of architecture itself. So um, for instance, here are some images of um, natural conditions, systems, uh, surfaces, and um, art practice, architecture, and even more kind of everyday uh, found, um, more pragmatic example on the far right, uh, the, the, the lower um, grouping being t uh, the Tara Donovan styrofoam cup installation, uh, piece by Anthony Gormley, a house by Mass Studies, um, Min Suk Cho and uh, called Pixel House, and then the the <coughs> pile of hay at the end, which I came across in the Central Valley in California, covered with this tarp held down by slices of tires as counterweights. And one thing I think that runs there's a kind of thread through these examples, or several threads. What one has to do with um, uh, systems of accumulation and figuration and as well as um, a, a kind of defamiliarization in, in I would say all of these instances at the bottom uh, the, the, the cups um, the, the figure of the body in the Gormley piece the, a brick being kind of treated in a, in a new way in the pixel house or the, or the tires in the less designed, less self-conscious version at the end. So to jump into the installation category, um, there's a, a series that have been based on a, a particular material that I'll show, but I want to first introduce this, um, this uh, group of our projects with, with a, a pretty, um, uh, quick and low budget but high effort, uh, relatively high uh, on our end uh, installation at UVA we did a few years ago. But what drove this project was the fact that we had to get it across the country in a pretty economical way and have it be um, it, it, able to be installed by others not familiar with the project. So we, we um, worked with this idea of, of a giant kind of image um, that brought together two of our projects is in this pleated, uh, folded, large-scale print that wrapped the whole gallery. And that uh, could be flat-packed and shipped fairly easily, given the size of it once it was up. Um, and the, the name lenticular origami refers to this, uh, the structure of it coming from uh, the, the pleating of the print, um, printed paper and, and this lenticular aspect being like those old postcards, you know, that you turn and see one image or another based on your angle of view. So this is a, a close up of the file. And so when it was put up in the space, uh, if you were on this side of the pleats, you saw our um, jellyfish house project, various images of it, and on that, this side, um, our reef project. And so as you moved, one would turn into the other. Or if you um, happen to be in a position like this, you, you could actually uh, perceive both at once, kind of moving through each other. Um, one of our first uh, installation scale pieces that it, it, it's ended up with this particular material, this paperwood product that we've used in a number of projects by now. I, it didn't start that way. It started with a simple idea that we could make a kind of hybrid between a curtain and a blind. And it would be um, 
a, a cellular system whereby if you moved one cell, it would move its neighbor, and it, you would always have this kind of interaction between the cells, uh, as you see in the, the images of a single module, kind of like those old rubber coin purses. I don't, you guys might be too young to remember those, but when you squeeze them, they pop open. Um, and so the first uh, prototypes were made with, with a cardboard, um, but, and with each cell different being attached to its, each cell independent and attached to its neighbor. The, the ultimate um, version or iteration was when we moved to the, the paper wood, which is a micro laminate that you can customize in terms of the makeup of this material. Uh, wood is always part of it, but it can have cloth or, or plastic or paper or um, in the middle or two faces wood and so on. Um, it's a um, supplier out of Michigan actually who, use, who supplies that product for many industries including like car dashboards and things like that. They have, uh, we've been some of the first people to use it in architectural applications so far. Um, but here we moved in this later iteration to a strategy of trying to, we, we weren't happy with the broken joints between all the modules and so here this idea of a spiraling laser cut piece that would wrap halfway into the next neighboring module achieved more of a um, integration and, and a better interaction between them which because the idea was you could go and push this thing and then the whole thing changes its form and shape subtly as you move any given part of it. Um, more recently, after an invite to the uh, Guangzhou Design Biennale a couple years ago, we, we you know, we're still have this material on our minds and um, samples of it and are still interested in playing with it in more three-dimensional forms. Here, what they asked for was, um, they invited uh, 20 architects, I think, from around the world to do a quarter, quarter scale p model of a pavilion of which they chose a few to build full scale. The full scale size of the pavilion was, they were all cubes, that was the given format, but the full scale was two meters on a side. It had to deal with in, in habitation in some way and a given traditional Korean poem and uh, Korean reinterpretation of a Korean garden. Those were the givens. So these images show some of the textures and of shade and tactility and surface of, in the garden uh, that we uh, found and were drawn to. And we thought about the cube having a kind of massiveness, yet at the same time uh, transmitting light in a manner that would be like that kind of dappled light on the uh, ground coming through foliage and so on in the garden. And then the way that it would be inhabited is um, in this void space that transitions from sitting to a lying position. So the diagram on the right um, gets at that. And in a way it's a bit like that Gormley, although we didn't, we weren't looking at that Gormley at this time, but we came to realize afterwards that there was some similar sensibility. But this idea of a a kind of um, transcription of the space around the body into, into um, this other um, formal system around it. Uh, and so here we took that interwoven um, idea from in our curtain and this di diamond shaped uh, lattice that was projected radi radially throughout the cube, which you can see from the diagrams there, and the, in, which, which produced an array of two different forms of modules, ones with curved edges and ones with straight edges. In the end, they all are, are formed with straight edges, but they're, in terms of the geometry behind them, there are curves behind about half of them in terms of how, how they're geometrically defined. And they, they basically interlock and interweave um, a pretty laborious process of, of um, assembling them, which, which might have 
had to do with why they decided not to do this one full scale. Uh, <laughs> but still, we were happy to do it quarter scale, which you know was about this big. And ship it just so we have either some details within the void. And then um, the largest application of this material, um, a different formation of it here, it's um, backed by a, a cloth and a bit thicker and more robust. But, um, and so, I mean, part of what we're drawn to with this material is it's, you know, if depending on the light, it seems like solid wood or, it, or it's, it begins to glow and becomes translucent and it's rendered as something um, that's not simply solid wood. It, it takes on these other um, characteristics in a phenomenal way at times. But again, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't start with the material. We knew, you know, we might end up with it, but what we started with was more of an investigation of um, a particular um, concept and, and geometric shapes. And the concept was um, this idea of forming modules uh, with, with folded um, edges that are not straight lines, but curved folds, and there, there's a whole world of this, this kind of computational origami and people around the world doing amazing things with, uh, you know, tech, technical versions of origami where folds can be, um, become quite complex. In this case, w it was through this kind of iterative process and arraying a simple curved module and under, starting to understand that the, the larger scale curved form that that wants to take based on the nature of the module and the, how they nest together and so on that we began um, with. And then another concept that drove it um, was this idea that we, we decided early on we didn't want the gallery to be, um, that Sayar gallery you know, has this running set of installations by a, a whole, you know, a lineup of, of some pretty amazing architects. But we, um, some of them have been objects, some have been much more immersive, and we were drawn more to this idea of it being more um, immersive or something that you'd be inside of versus something that you'd look at from the outside. So this was a very early study of, of this notion of kind of filling up the gallery right to the walls not entirely, but mostly. And then um, also a kind of set of structural investigations and structural thinking um, informed the, how it proceeded. From there, um, we, we paired up with Bureau Happold and brought this idea to them um, to, for them to help us kind of um, finesse and optimize. Um, but, but, Basically, you know, this is actually a cover of a, a book, um, but you're probably familiar with this from the work of Galgi or Fray Otto, uh, but this idea of the hanging chain mirroring the pure compressive um, form of a vault um, and the inverse of that. And so um, the, we, we you know, knew these modules wanted, wanted naturally if they have curved concave um, forms to, to start to array into larger curved surfaces. So the hanging, this is a virtual hanging chain model that Bureau Happold um, worked uh, with, um, with our geometry and th their ability to kind of test it structurally. And w we did a number of these kind of comparisons of what we were modeling and what they were testing structurally to see how close they were. And the blue represents the Kind of intensity of the stresses, which start to obviously, you know, um, uh, go towards the seams and to the feet of, of the vault that hold hold these up, and so the pattern of uh, tessellation um, addresses that, where this the denser pack of of um, modules gets. Um, 
um, directed towards those areas where the greatest stresses are. But we also knew we didn't want it to be solid. So there, there was another investigation about like how porous we could get it. We wanted to have this lightness. And part of the idea of this thing is it's the name Voussoir Cloud um, is, you know, this play uh, or suggests this play on, you know, Voussoirs being these stones in an arch or a vault, which are assumed to be heavy, are in fact here as light as, 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 light as we could make them. Um, and not solid at all, but, but thin, hollow forms. And, and furthermore, this idea of porosity um, was pursued. And so the, it produced four different modules. Th no curved sides, one curved, two curved, and three curved. And where the three curved ones came together is where this void um, appears in the, in the array. And there were some pretty complex math we realized to really get this to fit in the gallery. Um, but so we ended up developing this unfolding script because the form changes as it cups, um, as, as you fold it and the curved seams push it into a curved um, form. We, we had to kind of reverse engineer that and figure out how to do that. Um, that's a rendering of it with like the wall of the gallery taken away. There's this idea of it kind of scaling down towards the coming, springing from the edge of a, of a soffit over the entry, which is off to the left there. And then it opens up to a higher ceiling. And then there's also this clerestory set of windows facing west. And it so happened our time of installation was at, you know, kind of a point in the year, a time in the year where we knew sun would be coming into the gallery at certain times through that clerestory window. Uh, this is the one working drawing for the whole project, uh, 2,300 pieces. And basically, everyone had a copy of this drawing. Uh, it, it was pretty involved. We had a great team of SciArc students and our people from our office working together. Um, it went together in about three weeks. Um, not three weeks straight, but more like intense weekends and some stragglers on during the week. Um, we were also in studio, teaching studio during it. But um, so the way they, they attach is simply with zip ties. There are these flanges which stiffen them. And at the, the point, the node where those come together at the corners, there's two zip ties. That was one of the trickiest things because this picture shows um, this fellow, you know, able to be inside um, the vault, but that you couldn't always do that, and um, so you had to reach through holes and you know with needle nose pliers, and it it proved a lot trickier than we ever imagined. And it also was a bit unnerving because it never really wanted to take take the form of the digital model. Um, until the very last pieces were put in. It, it almost snapped into place and was very taut, almost like a drum. The amount of tension in the surface was incredible. Um, it, we never imagined either that it, it would have that tautness. Uh, that's it completed and uh, with people, various views. I'll just walk through quickly, um, but you get this from this view, I think, this sense of the scaling down of those vaults toward the rear, this kind of ping pong vault, they, they scale down and alternate um, from side to side. And the denser pack of, of the modules towards the feet, where there was quite a bit of compressive load. It, it was lightweight material, but with 20, 2,300 pieces, you know, the, it's pretty concentrated, the load at those feet. Um, but so it was really interesting to see it inhabited in ways you know, that we assumed would happen like this during openings and other ways we didn't know would you know, happen. And SciArc has that super long skinny building. You know, it's like a quarter mile long. And um, people have various modes of transport, students and you know, skateboarding and biking through. So this guy took a spin through um, a fashion designer found, discovered it during the opening and used it to shoot um, 
some of his work. He's, I mean, you, I think you get a sense of this kind of s scale shift from some of these images that um, you wouldn't expect when you come in the space underneath that soffit. But also here in this image, you see the um, way it acts very differently depending on how the light is, where there's this opacity on the right where there's no direct light hitting it from behind and then it begins to glow uh, here again more opaque and it's just slightly glowing from the ambient light. Um, and at night it was quite obviously quite different with artificial light all evened out from above. But during the day it did all of these you know, kinds of unpredictable things with the shadow as well as that glowing quality. Um, so that led to a brief project that was part of the um, uh, artist space gallery exhibition in, in Manhattan called uh, Matters of Sensation that Patterns put on, they were the curators of. And so this, what we did is we thought about inverting this, we called Voussoir Shell. Um, it ended up being more like a cloud in that it, it hovers in the space, literally. It's not supporting itself from the gallery walls or the floor, but just suspended. But it's more like a shell in terms of its structure. It's, it's a convex, from below anyway, con convex version, which we thought was an interesting challenge to push these concave petals, as we called them, into a convex form because you've got this kind of contrast of the overall form and this dishing or cupping or scalloping of the, of the surface um, against that. It was shown also in LA in a gallery. Now, now we have it hanging in our office. And so the most permanent of, of the installations involving this um, material is in a lobby in downtown San Francisco called one Kearney, uh, which and we call this project Lightful. This is the development. Um, it's on Market Street, right in the middle of the downtown, not, uh, not far from where SF MoMA is. Third Street is the street that ends in that neoclassical building. And that is the, those three buildings in a row are the whole development. The one on the end is by Charles Moore, one of his works from the late 60s, um, which was, is acting as a kind of structural brace and uh, vertical circulation um, supplement to the old building. And then most recently, this new building on the left, the, this uh, more modern structure that our lobby sits within. So this view of the lobby is on the, on the other side of that. The site's like a flat iron. It's a, it's a wedge-shaped site, so two streets come acutely together and um, off of Geary Street <laughs> is the main entrance. <clears throat> and so our project was an, a case where the, the owner and we together decided that this could potentially be counted as the public art for the building. The, the, these kind of developments often require a pub public art component we presented it to the San Francisco Arts Commission and they approved it. And it's, it's um, also marking the path or the, the, the lobby is the main elevator lobby. So it's the kind of threshold into the, all the floors above of commercial space, but it's also a public space threshold because on top of this building is, a, is one of these popos, so they're called nicknamed uh, privately owned public open space that developments also have to have often in San Francisco. So it had this kind of um, double life to it. Uh, the idea, the profile of the space was pretty much given. That, that was that these two lower areas to the sides and this high ceiling above um, was already dictated by mechanical equipment in the ceiling. And so we initially had this idea of this kind of modulated array wrapping all the way down the bent hallway towards the elevator, but it proved too much. And you know, it turned out the ceiling had to drop too far down for with existing mechanical 
equipment to pull that off. We couldn't really get the fluid um, form that we had studied at first. So we decided to concentrate the array of these ceiling, what we, what we thought of as transformations of coffers or, you know, which the old building has or had, and many old buildings have these kind of coffered, deep, deep relief ceiling situations. But here, coffers that also act as, a, as the main light um, here by being backlit with LED, uh, an array of LED lights um, on t above each of these hollow uh, paperwood folded modules, which we fabricated, we acted as the kind of subcontractor for those. The, the faceted ceiling panels are built with a sim, I mean, ceiling and wall panels are built with a similar material laminated onto MDF, um, this, this kind of thin composite veneer. And so this is a view from behind the um, reception desk. There's a mirror, you don't see it on there, but there's a set of hidden displays behind the mirror um, that are part of the historic com display component of the building. And then as you enter, you get, you know, if the lights are off, the, the, the two, the array of ceiling coffers and the wall start to feel like the same thing, but when the lights are on, it, it transforms into this glowing um, chandelier of sorts, which changes its form as you move around because um, of the nature of the cutting plane that trims it. And this is looking back towards the street. So at times, they all kind of bundle together in this ball almost, you know, when you're far back in the hallway versus the way you see it from the street. It has quite a different nature to it. And so around that time, we have, um, we had looked into a number of these strategies for similar um, ideas, but very different forms and systems and materials for various um, concept store and pop-up store designed for MAC cosmetics in Manhattan, uh, what, uh, Honolulu, and Hong Kong. And that's been over a number of years we've done um, these exploratory designs for them. Uh, and so the last uh, kind of jump forward to our most recent project in the category of installation slash in, this is more interior design really, but we just completed a recent installation in this building. So it's a 1940s concrete warehouse with a combination of steel and wood structure. Obscura Digital is the client um, and uh, immersive media company who works with giant scale projections on the one hand, like they've recently projected on the a Sydney Opera House, the Guggenheim Museum in New York, and the Garrett Concert Hall in LA, inside and out, these kind of amazing, they map complex surfaces of architecture and, and create the media and bring the hardware and set up the event, so they're like a kind of all-in-one media company. But they also do big touchscreen surfaces as well. Um, for some of their other work and projections in domes. So they, what they required is a prototyping space and a showroom to show prospective clients um, examples of their work. And obviously office space, creative and production areas, computer work, working areas, workshops for fabrication. So those three images at the top are the three levels of this building as we found them. They were pretty much disconnected, although the third one on the right there is the mezzanine, and that was fairly open at its edges to the second floor below. But the second floor, the, which we decided we really wanted to be the main level, which is this floor plan, was totally disconnected from the ground floor where with the loading bays and the day-to-day uh, -day entry off the parking lot, which is at a lower level. So what we, the main move um, is, incidentally, was a super low budget project. So we had to be very strategic about where we, we, what we did and where we did it. But the main move spatially was to cut three bays out of the middle of the building, which allowed one of their projection domes 
to fit in the space. It wouldn't have cleared otherwise vertically. And then to wall off the upper mezzanine, which we had to do because uh, it would have been a three-story space and we, there wasn't a budget to deal with like the fire suppression system that you need for that. And anyway, the people up in the mezzanine would want to be more private. Work, they worked on computers day and night, and they kind of like to be in their own little world. So that made sense. And then introducing this bank of offices to this, on the south edge, open um, creative and marketing area on the north side, a main um, conference room overlooking the void with this showroom and um, prototyping space in the middle. And then our office is actually at the end. We moved in to this space last year. It, it was actually an arrangement where we did the design in exchange for space. So we, we um, actually collaborate with these guys sometimes. We have some ongoing projects. Um, and it's a nice arrangement. It's a great space to be in. And it's you know in San Francisco, where sp space of this size is quite pricey. It's a, probably a kind of space we wouldn't be in these days until we get bigger paying commissions and so on. Uh, but so this is one of the main moves we did, which there was a pretty mean little entry when you came in the main entry um, here. And it's a half level down. And there was just like a, a railing and a little three foot wide stair wrapping around the elevator core. So we blew that out and put this um, 25 foot wide stair there's the conference room, which has this more complex geometry on one side, which I'll explain in a second. This is basically the reception area and the view upon entry. Um, this is from the other end, where this, the, one of their geodesic domes is placed in the space, with the, which is a hemispherical projection screen inside. And so basically, those are these um, V braces or X braces you find in a lot of buildings in San Francisco for seismic reasons. Usually they're, you know, in a kind of coming from an upgrade that happened at some point in time. And that's the case here. So this braced frame, set of braced frames marched down the middle of the building and we had to accept them. We couldn't move them obviously. So we thought of the conference room as kind of shrink wrapping around that to allow this wedge shaped stairway to drop down into the void space, which, you know, as the main communication stair for the, um, building in the center. And then the conference room is clad in um, plaster uh, outside and black stained bamboo on the inside. There's some more shots of that geometry where it kinks in and follows this line at the floor of the angle of the stair, but up above the geometry adapts to um, accommodate the, the X frame, brace frame. These gratings, the aluminum gratings, we repurposed. They were actually attached to these pretty chunky wood uprights on the top mezzanine. And we, since we were closing that mezzanine in, we had a stack of gratings that you know, it hit us. That we actually had a fancy steel plate rail designed, and the budget didn't allow it. So we had to re-strategize. And it seemed not a bad thing to repurpose those gratings. So that's what all the railings are made from. And then this polygal uh, material, the twin wall polycarbonate is cladding all the bank of offices, which themselves are these twisting um, surfaces, ruled surfaces made by simple uh, off the shelf, you know, light gauge metal stud framing, just at, with two different geometries at their top and bottom. So that kind of echoes the, the geometry of the conference room, but it also produces this um, well, I'll show you in a minute, this kind of rhythm down the hallway. Of the, we didn't want just a wall with doors punched in it. We wanted to slip the entries into those offices. Some more views of the conference room. Yeah, you can see this is looking one way down that hallway. You don't really see any doors. You just see the, um, these kind of planes of these funnels which pop out of the twisting surfaces and form the entries. Um, this is the file. In the conference room, we made an array of CNC milled holes, a pattern that, that the light um, configuration also 
is organized around, but it's, it's for acoustic purposes. It's all hard surfaces. And so above this bamboo and the ceiling is an acoustic fabric and the holes themselves help modulate the sound. Uh, that's a view inside. And then that same approach was used to handle anywhere, you know, any of the functions we need. So the floor air registers for the HVAC system, the audio um, for the screen that was um, flush mounted into the bamboo was all through the same technique of milling. Um, in this kind of gradient pattern. That's looking the other way down that hallway where all the doors face you. And then this is our office until recently. We always had planned to have a kind of more defined separation or between our space and the rest. And also a, a way to just terminate the view because that glass walled conference room is at the opposite end of this space. And we didn't, you know, think they and their obscure and their clients should have to look at all our crap in our office. This, you know, looks nice and neat there for this photo shoot, but it's not always that neat. Usually not. Um, and so, this is the um, some of the modeling that we um, developed for this idea. Of, we always thought. That dome is right there. It's, it's, it's a kind of iconic thing. Obviously, the legacy of Buckminster Fuller, but it's also iconic in their history, obscura, the client's history. They worked with these domes. It's one of the original kind of immersive spaces they made with projections inside. So we took the dome and kind of imprinted it on this wall as a negative um, space a subtle one. And then the modules are all tilted perspectively in a certain direction to screen the view and filter the light. So as you come around this way, down this walkway around the double height space and around the dome, at this point you get this kind of screened or filtered view into where our office is on the, um, right behind that. And then if you're coming this way, it becomes much more opaque. Incidentally, just to describe, basically those are 24-gauge 20, 20, uh, powder-coated sheet metal, laser-cut, each one different, 184 or something modules um, on 33 steel straps, which are 24-gauge laser-cut, and they're pinned, at, they're clamped to the beam at the top and, and pinned into the floor at the bottom. So those are in tension and all the modules suspend off of those straps. Um, this is kind of a straight on view from the main space side. And then from our side, uh, the hollowness of those modules is, is um, used as um, a, a bookcase to kind of display the periodicals and so on that have our work in it. Um, and so that also changes, you know, pretty strongly depending on which way you look. One thing, it came out very subtle, but we always thought it would be nice to see this negative space of the module itself as diff a different tone from the outside. And, but um, the, uh, the budget didn't allow a custom powder coating color, so we picked one that's quite subtle, this light gray, and it does, we, in the end, we kind of like the subtlety of it because at times it just looks all white, but then other times the gray really pops out like in this view. And ultimately, it's about this kind of filtration of, of view and light and the, the double functioning aspect, obviously, of it being a screen but also a bookcase. And there, these are some installations I'm not going to talk about today in the interest of time. I'm just going to end the installation category with this one last project. But th these are a whole group where we pursued light as a medium using fiber optics on um, the motion project at SF MoMA, a fiber optic room in the middle, and then um, light cone, our, our proposal for the Guggenheim Museum's 50th anniversary, where they invited a group of architects and artists from around the world to make an installation proposal for the void inside Frank Lloyd Wright's Guggenheim.
Um, so the last installation is this PS1 um, um, proposal from a couple years ago called Reef, uh, which we call Reef. But I'm sure you're familiar with the PS1 um, warm-up series where they have this you know, event each summer now for about 10 years now or more, maybe more like 12 years, I think. Um, this was, I think, the ninth year or something um, of that series. And so we proposed two kinds of forms, this overhead canopy and this set of mounds. And the idea was that, that you have these concrete walls of the courtyards at PS1. Um, and so we wanted to, you know, have a pretty simple direct structural system. And those walls are, you know, quite strong, obviously. If we had a lightweight um, installation, they could, be, they could structure the installation. So we proposed these um, cable trusses to just span across the wall uh, the walls in this um, form, this radial pattern that comes from connecting corners and um, perpendiculars at those angles and so on. Um, and then this, th there was a whole s set of layers of this kind of flow analysis of the space and how you move through it. And that um, flow diagram gets kind of projected through the canopy array and onto the mounds below. It's the same set of vectors that controls the modulation of the mounts and the canopy. And so it was a pretty subtle proposal in terms of from the outside of that courtyard, you don't see a lot. We kind of like the idea that you would be surprised or discover this other world when you come through the entry. But you can see from these above views, um, this basically, we. What the concepts behind this, aside from the practicality of just you know the structure and using those walls, was trying to make a space that felt like um, being under the water, like at the be the theme of this is called is the urban beach, and that's um, each year they talk about this being this kind of urban beach, and so we thought about you know what would it would be amazing if you could make a space that was like that. Um, with caustic reflections, like when you're scuba diving or under the, the waves or, you know, at the beach rather than on the beach. So with, that's what guided, you know, the materiality and this trying, and uh, the main program that they require is seating, shade, and just, you know, this, some water element. And it's about this different kind of um, inhabitation during the week versus when they have those DJ parties. Uh, this is the work we did, and we used digital project, and this project um, benefited from that kind of parametric approach because we did a lot of, you know, messing around with the overall form and with the 1,300 modules, um, it, it made sense. To, so here in this diagram, you see this lenticular cable trusses, the, the wooden cross members that span across um, the fabric modules that hang from them, all kind of controlled by this control surface in terms of the shape uh, of, of those modules. And, the, and we thought, you know, the, the way to really test this is to build a model as close as possible to the building of the actual thing as we could. So this is a 3 8 inch equals a foot model with all the modules built, laser cut, and, the cable trusses built as well. Um, and the nice thing with the, I mean, the quantities were all kind of easily tracked with that parametric approach. Like we had it all templated out, ready to go for sheets of rolls of fabric for laser cutting and the, the wood being um, laser cut or milled as well with, um, for the mounds as well as the cross members. Just some views inside the model. That's the approach to the mounds, how they would be built out of this marine plywood set of ribs. Um, and this idea that the mounds themselves could act as lights within the space when the sun goes down, being lit from beneath. Um, so then we did a mock-up, third scale mock-up of the system, the cables, the um, cross members and the fabric. And 
we tried animating this to because we knew it was you know part of the idea was we wanted it, we knew it would, it's windy there at times it's going to blow but even with a gentle breeze it would really you know hopefully convey this idea <coughs> this notion of being beneath the waves so the easiest way ended up being just making a um, getting a fan and blowing it after all these attempts to I mean we did this animation for the sake of presenting the project to the jury um, so this um, but it's one thing to move through the space and another to move through the space and have all the modules moving as well as anyone knows who's done the animation um, but here we it's really dark up there but Maybe you, I think you'll get the sense of it. We, we were trying to convey the different um, quality and the, this shadow and what it w might be like to move through the space during the day. Um, and uh, there's a soundtrack that w one of our team members made um, to go with this video. At the water elements were both these kind of misters in the mounds and at times um, this um, rain coming from the canopy when you come into this other courtyard. And the material here looks kind of shiny, but what we proposed was in fact um, a, a mesh, a polyester mesh it is um, not such a tight weave that it would ca catch the wind too strongly. This was one place in this weird, there's this little mini room, kind of outdoor room off of the courtyard where we tried to, you know, animate the modules. But that's also the one place you would come into close contact with them because we pulled them down so that you would kind of swim through them as you went into that little space. Um, but the idea of the video, too, was to show, you know, this transformation because what warm-up is all about is it becomes this big dance party. Um, and that was fun for our team. They, they green-screened themselves and their friends, and we thought they did a pretty good job of, with limited means, you know, to get this sense of the animation of the space with all this movement. Some kind of goofy movements going on there, but well, I don't know if those will become, you know, uh, popular dance moves. Um, so, um, that was that. We had a great team of people and it was an exciting thing to be a part of. I'm moving to the building scale group. Um, these are three projects. Again, I'm not showing, but just to introduce this. Uh, but one thing that is kind of a constant, I think, through this building scale work is both the, the site specificity of, of the form and the, and the strategizing of negative space um, in, in terms of how that form um, meets the site. And um, this is a, a, a matrix of images I've shot over the years but, that we show often to just refer to like some of our, the way our thinking changed when we moved back to the Bay Area about nine years ago now. Um, but we kind of looked around us and took stock of this amazing array of the way people manipulate their landscape. You know, in most of these cases, it's, it's, it's a private, landscape, a house or a business, but where there's this real sense of a kind of synthetic nature or constructed um, version of, um, you know, where, and a questioning of what's architecture and what's landscape, ultimately. Um, in programming at times of spaces, like at the top, where the main entry to this house and the kind of service entry where the garbage is put is, is like carved out as voids through this hedge. Um, a, a full range, I think, of from figuration to abstraction, of how people work with um, between landscape and architecture, but through the act of cutting, in that case, um, trimming the hedge. Uh, so 
Here is um, one of our first built projects in San Francisco from a couple years ago in the North Beach neighborhood. That's a view on top of the roof. Um, and this, you can see the pyramid building and Coit Tower in the distance. And that's a diagram of all the negative space, uh, open space within the mid block. It's, San Francisco is quite dense. It's supposedly the second densest fabric or population density in the country after Manhattan. Um, but they, so this is a case of like party, you know, or infill built housing and commercial um, kind of fabric where any outdoor space is pretty prized. Um, so there was a building at the back of this, the footprint is in the pink color there. Um, there was an existing building falling apart and usually you can't build a residence right at the back of a lot according to the San Francisco zoning, but we were able to because that older building existed, so it was kind of grandfathered in. This is a diagram of the solid void situation. Another thing I wanted to say too is we, you know, thought of our courtyard space as part of this network of the inner block spaces. And so that happens through this one little kind of channel of this balcony space. It's uh, actually there's a laser pointer here. This finger in a sense, that's the main corridor. This front building we didn't do much to. It has, it's an Edwardian style building with a commercial space on the ground floor and two story or two bedroom apartment above. And, but there's a passage through that building that's the only way to get to this back new house that is our design. And that shows more of the kind of formal solution. Uh, we made a screen wall on the back of the front building to give privacy to the new building and then some of the systems of surface and enclosure of the project pulled apart. We had to put in a three-story steel moment frame for seismic. Um, I mean we could have done one of those brace frames but in this case we wanted to keep that east facade facing the courtyard as transparent as possible. Um, that's what you see, we didn't do anything to this existing Edwardian building. It was just putting in this steel door, this kind of subtle um, marking of that passage. But then when you open the door, you get this wood-lined um, kind of deep threshold into the, the site and the courtyard. And then you um, arrive with this very transparent, I mean, the, the way this building has to get most of its daylight is, is by you know, from this east-facing wall. And the materials are stainless uh, steel fascias, a glass channel, um, and um, Ipe rain screen. There's a south-facing deck we worked in to the upper level. It's three-story, small house, about 1,200 square feet. That's looking across the courtyard where we did this kind of gray dated louvered screen on the back of the other building for privacy. Um, it was a pretty nicely proportioned space and the materiality, of, you know, this brick wall which existed, uh, we wanted to obviously keep and not cover up. And then inside, uh, it, I should mention too, this was for a client whose purpose was to sell this whole thing as a spec project, which he did. Um, so it, it wasn't, you know, a typical residential commission where you're designing to all the client's needs and desires for their own home. It was more speculating about a kind of loft-like spatial quality that would appeal to, a, you know, a range of buyers. But we, so we tried to really work with pulling the light into the space as deeply as possible and float. That's the second level on the right. Actually, both these are up, up at the second level. And then the third level is this open loft which grabs on to the braced, or the uh, moment frame steel to support itself, but lets light spill in from the south facing balcony above. And then there's this idea about lining some of those spaces with this other materiality, which is this pecan wood floor, contrasting the whiteness of the rest of it. Um, these are views, and that's uh, of the corridor, and this coming back out towards the street through that passageway. Um, another residential project from the last uh, couple years is we were part of the Ordos 100 where 
Ai Weiwei worked with Herzog Namura and invited 100 architects from around the world to be, have a villa design in Inner Mongolia. Uh, one of 100 architects from around the world. These are some shots. That one's mine out the plane window flying to Ordos on the first trip. Those are not mine, but they're of not that exact area. They're actually a, a, a ways away, but uh, instances we were inspired by, these are actually portions of the Great Wall in China, but where it's become so eroded over time and, and uh, this aspect of negative space, you know, is appears in another form in terms of like, it, but there's again this blurring of what is architecture and what is the site. Um, and this very dramatic but severe, you know, kind of environment, which you see on the left. Basically, the site was sand dunes when we arrived. Um, these are some images of, um, I found this pile of bricks on the site from a construction project and just seemed intrigued by that. Um, th and this is Ai Weiwei's own um, studio compound in Beijing in the middle, and that's the work of Andre Block, a uh, sculptor whose work kind of pushed the limits of what you could do with brick. So we, they encouraged us to not go too far beyond the typical building of systems and materials and approaches because it wasn't like this unlimited budget project. We had a pretty um, strict budget we were given. So they said, we highly encourage you to use some version of what they're familiar with there, which is concrete frame, brick skin or brick infill and probably not steel construction and probably not like huge cantilevers and so on. So we were thinking like, what could you do with brick? You can treat it, you know, in this, in, in this range of very prismatic to angular to quite plastic a treatment of brick in terms of its spatial or formal potential. And so this is a diagram of a ruled surface in brick, but with the technique of corbeling where every course steps um, above the next one that was on our minds early on. Uh, this is one shot of the models, not all of them, but a lot of them in place where um, you've probably seen some of these shots. You, you get this, you know, definite sense of the architectural zoo or whatever, you know, everyone doing their own thing. What seemed great at first is we were up on a bluff where all this is more flatland. This is kind of a bluff. And so you, you have this sense of looking out, but right across the street is this huge opera house. And that's the museum, artist studios um, over here and a, a community center there. But so you're very close to these very public programs and it's, it's a single family house. And you're also on the public green space. Um, so you want to look outward, which this analysis was about. You know, you, you, this was a kind of view analysis of the, the bigger, more distant views and the, the more contained views. But um, while wanting to look out, it, it seemed like you also wanted this, you know, kind of protection or inward focus that, let's say, um, some examples you find in, um, uh, th in the Far East, you know, this idea of a courtyard being a place to focus inward and that as a, as a kind of paradigm, as a formal spatial typology for houses, the courtyard house, and, and obviously in other parts of the world as well, but pretty familiar to that culture there. And, but where, you know, this, in a way, an ideal version of a Western house is this, you know, more object um, um, type, look at me, but also look out, survey the landscape. So that, that seemed like our conundrum, our, our predicament, was how we could combine these spatial types, the inward and outward focus. We're also interested in this oblique spatiality we discovered in the Forbidden City on our way there. We stopped and um, went in Beijing. Uh, the, some of these spaces there seem so axial and really you know, hierarchical, but in fact you get this offsetting of doors constantly and walkways start to have this oblique aspect to them. Anyway, so our site footprint we took as a driver of the form and 
then manipulated it depending on the prevailing winds, closing down this void space where um, the winds were coming from and opening it up where we had the greatest views, but also the orientation to the south and the east, which are preferred culturally, and you know it, they happen to be the best views as well on this site. Um, so that's what this diagram is about, the kind of generation of that form and the negative space. The whole thing gets trimmed off by this kind of plane that was generated by, by lifting the topo um, up, abstracting it as a tilted surface. So this is the you know, pos positive or solid void diagram. That's the circulation, which wraps around this inner courtyard at the heart of the building in two forms. It's kind of a double helix. There's interior circulation in the green and exterior on top of that and pink. And then that circulation hooks up with these three different outdoor living spaces. So the indoor and the outdoor living spaces become really intertwined and interlocked through that device of the circulation wrapping the central void. Um, site plan with some of the other neighboring villas, which you know we didn't know until our second visit, then we saw what people were doing. But some people's houses changed pretty dramatically when they went back. Others stuck to their design. Our, our design changed somewhat when we you know, went back and produced our final design, but that's it on site. <coughs> A couple views. Uh, we really struggled with fenestration and idea, you know, this notion of the publicness of the site and all of that, and the scale shifts around us. Um, but basically, the apertures close down on the north um, where the winds come from and open up towards the views in the south and the east. And um, that's a model that we didn't build, but luckily we got to, we built some scrappier models, but in in Shanghai and Beijing was an exhibit um, of uh, a bunch of the American projects that traveled around that Canon Design did. And they built, they had models built for that show. So it was nice to see um, this built in a different way, this very monolithic, solid white kind of um, mass of a model, um, but with a lot of detail. Um, and so you get the way these cracks or fissures feed into that middle void, I think. But what we spent a lot of time on was the nature of the corbelled surface and, and, and kind of sorting that out. So we, we modeled every course of bricks, you know, to see how these corbels would pull to these, and thought of it almost like, almost like a fabric or having this sense of tension pulling to the corners of the form. But then intentionally contrasting that, the uh, east and west elevations are totally flat. So the north and south are, are ruled surfaces which twist, because the footprint twists as it goes up. But the east and west are flat. And this is the entry kind of auto court entry facade. And we developed different brick patterns depending on what, it, what side it was on. So here we had a stacked, staggered bond, as we called it, um, bricks which uh, are not, uh, I mean, are actually staggered by the five degree um, tilt and adhere to that geometry. But then because these windows are orthogonal, pushing into a tilted opening at the face, these are little twisting surfaces for the jams, which that detail is about. So those are these kind of mini corbel um, jam conditions that go into each aperture. Um, and just to say, you know, they wanted basically, they said design development, but what they meant really, we came to find out was like really pretty worked out working drawings. Um, if you wanted your building to turn out how you hoped it would, on the outside especially, the interiors they proposed would be more up to the individual clients who, who bought these. Um, some renderings, Th these renderings don't actually have the, proper brick coursings, that was like a whole other endeavor. But the model had the, the corbeling and the drawings of the elevations all had the bricks all drawn. But when we rendered it, that just was 
beyond, I mean, we had put in like a lot of work up to that point and it wasn't even clear it was happening, the project by the end, which it's proven, I think, to be the case. And uh, who, no one knows if it really is happening. But this is views of the void, this interior and exterior circulation working around that in the middle and views outward, the main living dining space. Um, and uh, sorry, off to the left is one of these exterior stairs kind of caught within the skin going up. This is the one going down, spiraling around the central void, and that one goes up to the uppermost roof terrace on top. And then the entry uh, view coming into this auto courtyard next to the garage um, where this fissure kind of marks the entry. And so the last of the, the building scale, um, I mean, I, that's a little misleading because a couple of the so-called um, speculative projects are building scale, but the difference is this work is all for kind of the here and now intended to be built, and not, even if it's not being built. Um, whereas those projects at the end I'm going to show are about looking into the future. Uh, this we just did this summer um, with um, our office. It was a big competition. You've probably seen some of the entries online. They've begun to be posted. That's the site in Busan, the second largest city in Korea. There's this mountain range, pretty dramatic, huge uh, harbor, very industrial working waterfront, you know, port city, massive container port, one of the biggest container ports in the world. And they want to clear this out and make a cultural civic center out of this area with a whole range of programs. That seemed really intriguing, seeing this image. Seeing this a little less so, we were a bit, a bit frightened by that. But they claimed that this was not you know, don't take this literally, it's just kind of a placeholder, uh, so we'll see. But that, that's the site on this artificial island of the Busan Opera House. They talked about it being, you know, a kind of signature, iconic landmark building similar to the Sydney Opera House. It would really, you know, bring this new identity to Busan. The center of Busan culturally and is more that way and where the tower, like those tall buildings by Asymptote and some of these other projects is, are over there. So they're trying to kind of make this other center here. And so, I mean, yeah, you can see some of these towers are, look quite familiar actually, maybe. <laughs> um, but anyway, we, we, uh, we took some liberty with the island and the site, but not much because they <clears throat> said that's pretty hard and fast, the shape of the island. And, so on, but we didn't like the jelly bean shape so much, so we at least thought about reforming that. But um, to describe the Opera House approach, since the site is not even existing really, except the bigger picture of the geography of Busan, in a way we had to look inward or think about like, you know, some imported idea or like bringing ideas to the site. And one, <clears throat> idea was this, the name we gave the project Trifold Madang. Madang is, it means a, a number of things, but one thing it means, it, it, its definition is a, is a courtyard in Korean language and culture. And it, and it turns out the Korean opera was quite um, defined as to how it began, and it actually began being performed in courtyard spaces as this almost like hidden art form. So we were excited about that idea, and just in terms of a geometry, since the sites didn't seem to offer one, this more autonomous form, uh, this is what's called to, uh, Sam Taeguk, a symbol, which is like the yin-yang symbol, Taoist, so, but, but um, a version of that where there's three lobes that spin around. Um, and there's various forms of it you can find. You know, this is actually a construct, a bowl someone's made, the, the Olympic symbol from 88, turning it more into like a trefoil um, yin-yang and so on. But anyway, so the program which we read as being threefold or trifold, the main opera house, the kind of flexible black box theater and all these other programs which were pretty open-ended but basically convention center, exhibition, restaurant, so on, commercial, shop. 
So we, we thought of it as a trefoil loop, looping circulation that linked together these three programs. Um, this is the first time we've shown this, actually. We haven't really got it out yet or anything. Um, but so um, kind of thinking aloud or whatever as presenting. Uh, but these are some of our diagrams we had in the presentation. That's <coughs> this. We introduced a mound because the site seems so flat and featureless. So there's this mound in the middle. You go up these three large kind of grand staircases meeting at this mound under the building, which hovers above. And then these are these three voids um, that, you know, interplay with that um, groundworks. And then so joint wrapping that is this trefoil or um, circulation loop or whatever that connects the three programs. And then continuing up around those voids are these um, stairs that go up to the rooftop. We thought this building being so dramatically sited on the water's edge with mountains around, you should be able to get on top of it. Uh, we actually started the competition with, in our office as like a mini competition, and one of the schemes was a quite vertical building, so it would have offered a much more, you know, kind of prospect of type pro overlook project, but we had a crit about it and decided we preferred this more low-lying building. That given they're proposing all these towers and who knows what they're gonna look like, why you try to compete with them was the thinking. Uh, so that's the form. Uh, some other diagrams about the various layers, the, the groundworks of the larger site with the mound in the middle, um, the stuff I just described, this inner or outer uh, shell of this porous skin, this inner liner of this wood um, surface that kind of tries to unify that internal space and then the rooftop. Uh, so some renderings um, where there's this modulated skin with these kind of eyelids that um, shelter these apertures. I mean, it, not all of this skin is in fact, transparent or open behind that second skin, but we like the idea of really unifying the form with this this um, dynamic pattern wrapping around it. Also, you know, reflecting some of the dynamism of the site with the mountain range wrapping around and the water nearby. And so, ultimately, you could come out those three spiral stairs that wrap around the voids to arrive on the roof. These are the plans down below. Um, Below the mound, actually, is um, a whole shopping area and restaurant area and the foot, in a sense, of the opera house and also the service to the multi-purpose theater and a collective space in the middle beneath the mound, so the mound's above this. And the next level is up at the you know, mound where the, the three... Um, program blocks are more kind of administrative and back of house, but fairly solid. And then so you continue up the, one of those three grand stairs to arrive on this kind of concourse or, or upper, or what we call the trefoil um, circulation ring that joins together with, with restaurant, cafe, and shop. They had a pretty long program list, but it wasn't specific in terms of areas. and they encourage a lot of interpretation of the program. We put this meeting, um, kind of convention meeting center out near the water. And um, an aerial view with the, uh, seeing it situated relative to the, the site and surroundings. Um, this is a view from the city side between the main, we thought of the main entry being this one because two bridges head towards it that are in the master plan, but we took some liberties with the kind of edges of that in terms of the form of it. Um, and then once you come in this main internal space, it seemed to want to really um, open up, I mean, orient to these void spaces, but have a very um, fluid, open sense in terms of joining all of this wide range of program. And we thought about precedents like the Berlin Philharmonic, you know, Sharon's 
um, project in Berlin where you get this constantly shifting um, set of views, which like it's all about kind of seeing and being seen before in intermission and after the performance. So that kind of dynamic space is what we're after. This is inside the opera house where you know some of the sensibility of that uh, wood liner informs the, the space of the theater itself and then just a view of it against the mountain backdrop on the water. So the last three projects, I'll try to move pretty quickly through these, um, are the more speculative ones and like I said, they it's where we were asked specifically to kind of look into the future for, I mean, it's it's interesting to us that that's happened at least three times. Actually, a fourth time. I just realized we have another new project. It's up, I think it just came down in Tallinn, Estonia, as part of the Tallinn Architecture Biennale. But they wanted a Knowing Our City of the Future project for San Francisco, a kind of version of that thinking for their city. So that was just, we haven't put that together to present yet, but. Um, you should see it somewhere soon. Uh, Jellyfish House was the first of these, and the house itself, the smallest scale of the, but the project was fairly big scale in scope in terms of how we thought of it. it it's situated on this island in the middle of San Francisco Bay, um, Treasure Island, and this was project was part of a show called Open House Architecture and Technology for Intelligent Living, uh, curated by the Beecher Design Museum. In, and in Europe and the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena together. They co-curated the show. They had a call for architects around the world. We sent in a proposal and got selected. Uh, this island we had been thinking about already quite a bit. It's, it's in development now. SOM has, has done a big master plan for transforming it. Um, at the time, they hadn't done that yet. It was an, another architect who was working on it. but. Um, we had been thinking about it for some time, used it for some studio projects as a, as a site and um, over the years. And this is some images. The island was built in the late 30s to sell it to, for this international exposition that happened. And it also you know, marked the culmination of the bridges. The Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge had just been completed in 38, 39. So the island was totally made. It was manufactured with fill, bay fill, and attached to this existing natural island of Yerba Buena, which the bridge, the Bay Bridge tunnels through. So it has this interesting sense of being kind of isolated in the middle of the bay, yet connected by the bridge. So it's not really an island in that sense, but it, because this is such a thin connector, and not a lot of people go out there as it is. It's, it's a former military base and they, um, highly problematic in terms of toxic soils and unstable um, seismic condition. What we proposed was this is the ideogram. Like what if that island could give back to the bay through um, actually cleaning its own gray water and the bay water, ultimately. So we thought of it being perforated by a series of wetlands and canals. And this is the kind of diagram, conceptual diagram of that, of, of all these new wetlands and canals, which would work together with this array of jellyfish houses. So these strands are all multiple um, configurations of jellyfish houses. And these are the five pieces of the Old Bay Bridge we proposed to take down and turn into living machines that would plug into the canals and the network of um, wetlands. That's a rendering situating it relative to downtown San Francisco and the Bay Bridge and the Bay. Um, the house itself we thought of as able to aggregate into different typologies, row, individual houses, row kind of denser rows, mats, more like horizontal dense mat living or even vertical slab. So those are just conceptual um, studies of that. The, the, all, the house we also thought of as being able to permutate from this tighter, smaller version to this branching 
growing larger version, but always with these three programmatic strands in mind, living, working, and landscape kind of intertwining. So that was a very early animation. Another thought, there's another kind of crude early animation. Um, this works all from about five years ago. Uh, well, it started in 2005 and went into 06. Um, uh, so we thought at, in this early form that the house could array its surfaces to start to collect rainwater. Um, and that's um, an early diagram, and we thought of it more as a kind of spine, a more hierarchical version. But ultimately, as we developed the project and worked more with the, the geometry of the skin and how these various layers of the skin would perform, um, harvesting rainwater, filtering gray water, capturing the rainwater, you know, treating its own, um, the, thinking of it like veins almost in the body, and the, but that the water would be treated through existing techniques um, that they use, uh, for instance, on offshore drilling rigs using UV light and titanium dioxide to treat, to, um, treat gray water or existing technology not yet used in architecture really, but like phase change materials are a potential way to deal with um, environmental control. So we thought of one layer being this quilted jacket of phase change material, which goes from a solid to a liquid. It, it collects heat and gives it back or vice versa. And then also the, the, the skin itself would have this kind of shimmering quality. I mean, the jellyfish was an analog for us as this creature with a very simple nervous system and no, or no nervous system really, or brain to speak of, no eyes, but it has this really sophisticated seeming way of interacting with its environment and even communicating through this, you know, blushing and changing color and so on. Um, there's a structural analysis, uh, which uh, this was a kind of mid-stage version of the project where we, we weren't quite managing the, the density of the pattern, but it was informed by the structure. It just, the form wasn't quite doing what we wanted, but that's more like the ultimate version where the surfaces we were able to, um, we worked with um, a, another firm process to Sean Alquist um, in the, in the uh, modeling and um, figuring out of these geometries. Basically, set of um, Delaunay triangulation cells overlapped with a Voronoi lattice, and that was instantiated in these different densities. And the cell itself would become more open if it was more horizontal or more closed if it was more vertical so that it could perform best to capture the rainwater. The, uh, and then, of course, like representing something that's in a changing state is you know, a challenge, but that's what we attempted with some of these renderings where the, the one thing I forgot to mention is the layers of the skin we thought of as not in a single state, not being just opaque, but constantly in flux between opaque and transparent. And that's the skeleton kind of onto which the layers of the skin adhere. And so that model was printed as a 3D print, uh, which we recreated recently because this was acquired by SF MoMA for their permanent collection. So we had to kind of revisit these files and make a big new print. This is one of the bigger prints you can do in one piece. Um, an ABS, F SLS process, um, ABS material. Th that's the house rendered. Uh, we have a series of renderings, but the best way to show it ultimately is a kind of 4D media, time-based, I mean, because um, th that was our, you know, way of trying to convey this sense of the constant um, responsiveness that this house would have to its environment or to the user's desires, you know, whether it is in a kind of auto mode of responding to ambient light outside or the, the filtering of the water through these, um, uh, the skeleton is, is seen more or seen less or whether the owner would want their house to not be doing that and be more simple 
solid, like in a, in a kind of stable state. Um, so that's what this was about, like trying to convey the range that the uh, envelope of this house could um, operate at. Um, and so you wrap up to the, 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 that last level, the main level was living, this is sleeping up above and working was down below. And so um, this last space is thought of as the kind of bathing area. I mean, it's, you can see it's, it's pretty open-ended. A lot of people had asked when we did this, like, well, what, what about furniture, you know? <laughs> but, um, that's something you know we think could work into this. That's another project within the project. But so that is just about this inversion of the shower inside versus the collecting of the rain outside. Um, the next to last project, Edgar Seat Showers in New York City. We we're invited to be part of the um, Downtown Alliance project, uh, for the Alliance for Lower Manhattan, which. Um, had a whole group of architects, Morphsis, Lewis Sermaki, Lewis, um, ARO, and artists, and uh, Work AC was one of them. They all, the sites were divvied up. We were asked to look at the tip of Manhattan, um, overseen by ARO and Bayer Blinder Bell together as the kind of master plan. But our, there were different phases to the project, and basically the point was that they thought that the tip of Manhattan had become kind of marginalized. We, you know, it's hard to think of any part of Manhattan that way. But in fact, the World Trade Center and Battery Park City have, and Wall Street have, you know, these crowds. And the tip of Manhattan, Battery Park, and the ferries going to, you know, Staten Island, Statue of Liberty, other crowds. But in between, um, on Greenwich Street, which is this street, there's actually not much for the locals or the tourists is how they put it, you know, that this area was underserved, that all these surrounding areas, you know, are, are active and dense. So we have to get the site a bit like Ordos is, was the most prominent in the whole development, it, it seemed to us, because it was exposed by this void above the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel and, um, on top of a street that used to exist, it's now covered up by an MTA parking garage. And they, they um, in the brief said, our site probably wanted an iconic tower kind of project. So we you know, took that and ran with it. Um, but our main interest was in reopening that street and strengthening the cross connections, east-west connections um, in lower Manhattan and so we thought about the project at this larger infrastructural scale, the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel touching down, at, well, with its vent stack only at Governor's Island. And then we learned through our analysis that Fifth Ave in Manhattan is exactly axial and aligned to our site, even though it stops there at Washington Square. We, you know, proposed that our tower at 1,300 feet is going to be plenty tall enough to understand that relationship. So basically, um, also, we're interested programmatically in how Fifth Ave is such a collector of these amazing institutions and spaces and buildings and, and a kind of spine of Manhattan where the, you know, the streets, the west streets and the east streets are, are brought together and it's the edge of the park. All of, all of this was in our minds um, and this idea of this to the geometry of Lower Manhattan being so dynamic and unlike the, the famous grid of Midtown and Upper Manhattan. So we basically took this idea of trying to make a space that would twist at the, from the ground, Ed, Edgar Street passageway to the alignment with Fifth Avenue at the top, and we, with Grasshopper, um, developed a script to do a whole array of twisting tower types um, iterations where the twist, the, what the script did was move the point of the twist up and down and the rate of, there's actually two twists I should say, there's a, um, um, this I think should explain it a little bit, there's a, a the two footprints of the site re reintroducing Edgar Street 
extruding those up, um, twisting those, and so the script adjusted where this twist happened, but then there's a kind of counter twist, and it's spreading a part of the edges so the void could open up or close, and that whole process was kind of, um, we thought was, it was beneficial to automate that because it allowed us to study many iterations of this and drop it into the context model and see what the best form in the context um, seemed to be, but always with this idea of the void of Edgar Street and the Fifth Avenue alignment at the top being the driver. Um, other ideas like harvesting daylight, it's you know quite dark in lower Manhattan down with these narrow streets at the base of the towers to try to capture daylight with fiber optics. This is our fiber optic room installation from several years earlier, but treating the void like a giant version of that and pulling daylight down through um, a series of diagrams uh, about how the skin might get modulated and um, opened up or closed down based on um, heat gain for environmental control or where better views are as well. And so that's um, kind of spinning around the whole tower, seeing this range of the modulated skin. And also the presence of our site being on this approach and you know basically the the entry and exit to Lower Manhattan, the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, the mouth of the tunnels right here. So the form attempts to address that site condition, this kind of scalp shape um, driven by that infrastructural condition. And then this um, twisting skin changing as it goes up, which we incidentally, it, the idea was it would be an exoskeleton with the structural cores in the center, much like the World Trade Center, old World Trade Center was. Um, so it's outer structural skin and inner structural core with no other columns um, to impede like the space in terms of how it could have a flexibility to program like. Basically the, the program is a, a more, um, well let me first talk about, the circulation proved quite tricky in a twisted form, but we did think, you know, we sorted it out fairly workably, which was these different um, banks of elevators going to different levels, feeding different programs. Um, and the fire stairs are the things that negotiate the twist. I mean, you could conceivably do tilted elevators, but we managed to skewer the, you know, twisting form with straight elevators and get the fire stairs to move around. And so at the heart of the building is this double atrium, which um, splits, at, it, it come, you know, starts from either footprint and crosses Edgar Street, and it's a kind of three-dimensional X. And um, programmatically, that's the heart of the building in terms of the more civic, cultural, and commercial program. And then the mid, er, the, above that would be office program from here, to in the mid portion of the tower and then from there up residential and then public again at the top. And so we thought of these twin atria as kind of lungs, the lungs of the building and that through a process of phyto remediation, you could filter the building's air um, by these terraria embedded in the floors of the atrium. So that's what those diagrams are about. And so here you start to see this effect of the glowing um, skin of that inner volume of the atrium pulling the daylight down with fiber optics um, and it bridging over the street forming this kind of new civic space which we you know studied a lot of these um, projects for Manhattan these visionary projects from the turn of the previous century and you you can find an amazing array of you know buildings which bridge streets and so on and some of this was inspired by that but, but the, the site as well, the, the pivotal and very visible situation of that building on that site, that it, we felt it demanded this kind of civic um, scale. And some views inside that double atrium looking up and down. And the last project quickly, uh, City of the Future, the History Channel held a competition. They, 
you've probably seen and heard about that it moved around. There were only two years of it. It seemed like it was going going to go on a run there, but I don't know if they're going to start it up again. But the first year was New York, LA, and Chicago, and then this next year we were involved with San Francisco, Atlanta, and DC. And so they invited a group of architects from each city to rethink their city in 100 years. You were given a week to do this and basically a three hours to install it all in a very public space. And the judging took place there. So in Manhattan, it was in like Grand Central Station. In San Francisco, it was in the Ferry Building, which is kind of one of the main civic spaces in the downtown. This was our, what we did was zoomed out at the larger scale of the Bay Area, which is known as the mega region, and think about um, <coughs> the logistics of network connectivity and how, you know, the Bay Area, because of its geography, is, is pretty hard to get around in terms of, like, the traffic has to feed through these, um, you know, thin threads of bridges and tunnels in certain places. But even in the cities, the freeways were stopped largely as a, as a you know, kind of major um, project in the 50s by the famous freeway revolts, they were called, where people rose up and said, no, we don't want these freeways cutting all through our city. The result is it's, you know, there was that famous one that was torn down um, along the Embarcadero, but other than that, freeways, and there's been another one that was torn down more recently, these, one of these viaduct raised freeways because they were damaged by the earthquake in uh, 89, but uh, the plan they had was to cover this, gr grid the city with freeways, and that never played out. So it's, it's quite difficult to get around on the surface streets and on public transport, because it just isn't that dense to serve the population density. So we, our, part of our argument was just to, to counter further outward sprawl, we have to densify the infrastructure at the core of the Bay Area. And then thinking about, you know, with global warming, you know, a lot of people are thinking about this these days, that, you know, what's going to happen with the land that's flooded. So we, instead of trying to hold back the water, um, in this case, thought all this land with a three to five meter rise in sea level um, is going to be flooded. And so what if we just trans live with that, accept that, but transform it into a new aquaculture zone where algae would be grown and used to produce hydrogen fuel, which, uh, it, you know, that is some technology and, you know, exploration that's underway. There's one of the um, found pioneers of, of that happens to be a professor at Berkeley where Lisa teaches, and we got to, you know, um, find out about some of the processes and technology behind that proposal of alternative fuel of getting hydrogen out of algae. And it's a big, long endeavor, obviously, and it's not sorted out. But the idea of this competition was to you know, project to the future of what could happen. So along with that green zone of algae uh, production and harvesting, is we also discovered under the city is a gigantic freshwater aquifer. It turns out they pump like a million gallons a day into the bay out of the BART tubes underground because it seeps in from this aquifer, which goes all the way from SFO, the airport, to Golden Gate Park. And it's where the early pioneers went, the settlers in San Francisco basically got their water. They just drilled down. And now it's um, piped you know, hundreds of miles from basically near Yosemite, the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. So we proposed both the aquifer and the ubiquitous fog coming off the Pacific Ocean could be a source of, of water and the, the algae a source of hydrogen. So it would be this kind of east-west energy exchange. Uh, one theme of the competition was um, the underground. They gave us these DVDs of that um, History Channel show called Cities of the Underworld. And they, they're kind of trying to market that show, but also the idea was like to think about the underground of cities and what it can offer. And so we largely cited much of our project underground, this hydro net, as we called it, a new infrastructural network 
capable of distributing fuel, people, goods, um, energy, power beneath the city, tunnel built with uh, robotics, self -drill automated drilling um, machines, and forming a network connecting the points of greatest need for transport and population density. So that, that, that lattice or, or um, Delaney triangulation network was coming directly from existing nodes of um, transport and pop population density. And then these things were, uh, we propose as these kind of connectors to the above world, and that's that algae zone. And there's another layer to the project about re inhabiting the Pacific coast edge of San Francisco with greater density. And so out of the algae zone, um, these so-called algae towers would grow to kind of further densify that edge, which happens to be the more dense area architecturally in terms of all the high rises are here. And um, well, at that end, this is more open these days, but soon to be densified. So we took that on the idea that these towers could be part of the algae production springing from that aquaculture zone, but also housing people in a high density kind of high rise situation. And to look at all these components of the project, we felt we needed to cut through the whole city. So we did this cross section from the bay to the ocean. Um, and this identifies the various components, this ocean fringe, the aquifer hub, bog flowers, which are these bog harvesting civic structures, geothermal mushrooms, another what we, we propose that part, the parts of the infrastructure that kind of bloom or blossom or emerge from under, that you know, are your above ground aspects of the system should really t become civic destinations and um, new, take part in the life of the new San Francisco. Um, the land portal, aqua, um, aquaculture zone and uh, edge or sea portals or whatever to get into the system, which I'll s explain in a second. This is a view along the ocean beach with one of these so-called fog flowers, more of them. The geothermal mushrooms up on top of Twin Peaks, which happen to be above where the greatest geothermal potential is. Some renderings of these um, algae towers. And then the idea about Transportation is a lot of people, you know, um, aim to push Americans into mass transport, and then a lot of people say that's never going to really happen, like it does in Europe or other places, Asia, maybe. But because of this, you know, founding of, of much of modern American culture and society on mobility and individual transport that cars offer. So what we propose is is hydrogen fueled, clean burning hover cars, automated, autopiloted when they come into these high speed situations or denser traffic flowing beneath the city in this network of tunnels. So this would be under an existing node, in this case in Barcadero, for anyone who knows San Francisco here, um, Mission Bay, but the, if, if that traffic was clean burning, it could also coexist with other forms of social space like um, uh, public baths or spas, which used to be in San Francisco, but kind of went away. Um, so we were you know, trying to think about all the potential that this infrastructure could offer. Um, and I think that's a final view of just this silhouette of this transformed edge of the city. Um, thanks. Perfect.